the worship, and uh, we're going to get we're going to jump right in now to session six of the indwelling life teaching, and the title of this teaching is guidance in you. We talked last Sunday about the glory of God that's in you, the glory of God that's in you that makes you a temple. The glory of God in you makes you uh, have the, the very presence of God inside of you. You don't have to go here, there, and everywhere to meet with God. You can go here inwardly and meet with him and know him. And so that's what, what, what we focus on in the last session. In this session, we're going to focus on God's guidance in you. And, and so I, I'm excited about this message. I think it's going to bless you. It's blessed, blessed me. I want to start by reading a passage of scripture that has probably, you might think, has nothing to do with what we're going to be talking about, but it actually does. And it's uh, Matthew chapter 24, verse 37. And this is a passage of scripture. It's about the days of Noah. It's this passage of scripture that has really been on my heart lately. Uh, I, I believe it's, it so describes the times we live in and what God's doing, what's happening in the world, what the Lord's looking for in the world. And so I just want to start by reading this. And I would encourage you to spend some time uh, reading Matthew 24, especially reading uh, chapter or verses 37 through 44. <clears throat> but the Lord is answering the question about the signs of the times and the end of the age and of his coming. And we know this passage very well, but... The Lord says, for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. That word coming is the, word, is the Greek word parousia. It means presence. So the coming of the Lord is not just a, it's not just like, he's not just describing the second coming when he comes back physically and glorious in the sky. He's talking about a, a, a season, just like it was in the days of the Lord, that the coming, the presence of the Lord, these are the days of God's presence, that the, the presence of the Son of Man will be like the days of Noah, his coming, which culminates in his second coming. Verse 38, as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. We know that, but basically the world was living business as usual, but there was a prophetic plan that was underway in God's remnant that no one else knew but this remnant that was hearing from God. And Noah was hearing from God. Noah was hearing the voice of the Lord. And he was preparing himself and preparing uh, his family and preparing his, the ark for what was coming. And God is raising up a remnant of people in this day and age that know the, the times and the seasons that we live in, that know the day and the hour, that know the prophetic things that are, that are unfolding before us, and God has his Noahs. God has his remnant, and I believe the more and more I'm getting into this, the more and more I'm realizing this remnant is very small. <laughs> How many of you are seeing that? Uh, this remnant is very small, even in the church. Most of the in the church are clueless to the day and the hour we live in. We live in prophetic times, and it's time to build the ark. We've got to be people of understanding and insight. And so he goes on, the Lord goes on. And he says, they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. So... The Lord is going to come suddenly. And most of the world is not going to even realize it. But God is going to have a people who are building their ark. Now, in one way, this could relate to prepping for what's coming. But that's not really my focus. My focus is on the spiritual preparation of God's people. Of making ourselves ready. Of being prepared. And that's what this class is all about. It's about how to, this, you know, the indwelling life of Christ. You could also say it's how to prepare your ark. How to build your ark. And uh, I was just thinking about this this week and just praying over this passage of Scripture. And the Lord just prompted me to, to buy Francis Frangipan's book, The Days of His Presence. He has a chapter on there on the Perusia. And I was, I was reading, uh, reading in his book... Francis Frangipan told this story that I wanted to share that uh, he was, I, I, I mean, how many of you know Francis Frangipan have heard of him? He's a real man of God. His books are incredible. I highly recommend every, all of his books. They're great. 
But he was sharing a story in the days of his presence, and he said it was about 1973, and he was a very zealous preacher back then, and there was a comet coming. There was a comet coming to the earth that was planning to hit in, uh, like, I think Christmas Day, 1973, and uh, the name of this comet was Koha, Kohatek, Kohatek, named after the Czechoslovakian astronaut, Kohatek. And so Francis Frangipan went and he warned, I think, 1,200 churches in Detroit, hey, the, the, the world is going to end on Christmas Day, 1973. He even got on, national t or even got on TV that spoke to 3 million people and was talking about, hey, the world's going to end on 19, in 1973. Uh, he found out, he, re he was reading in this, uh, in this religious publication of what this word, Koatek, means and it meant, it, this, according to this magazine or this publication, it says, the wolf that devours the lamb. This, this comet was coming, and its name supposedly meant the wolf that devours the lamb. So he was out there and proclaiming, okay, the world is going to end in 1973, Christmas Day, 1973. And so if you're here and you're breathing, you know that didn't happen. <laughs> he later found out, he was talking to someone who knew Czechoslovakia, and he said, what does the word Koatek mean? She said, it means... Add a rooster to the stew. <laughs> so he was like, okay, I miss God on that one. I miss the Lord on that one. But it got him to begin researching end of the world movements. And what he found out was in the year 1666, you know, 666, all, mo much of Europe was swept into this frenzy thinking, okay, th we are living, this is, this is a year when the world comes to an end. And he told the story that at the same time that much of Europe was panicked about the, the, the end, the world, the world coming to an end, there was a man, a, a monk named Brother Lawrence who wrote a book called Practicing the Presence of God. I don't know if you've heard of that story, but he began his writings, his letters in the year 1666. And so Francis, his point was that that we can be so caught up in, in all that's happening. And believe me, I, I believe we are living at the end of the age. I believe the Lord is coming back very soon. I really do. I, I, I look at this and I see it. But we can be so caught up in all the negativity of what's happening around us, we miss what God wants most importantly is that his people would learn to live by his presence. And so Francis, his point was that Brother Lawrence is a model to the end time church that no matter the signs of the times and no matter what it looks like and no matter as these end time things unfold is that our primary purpose is to learn how to live by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ, to learn how to live by his presence. Uh, and so, you know, if you, if you think about Noah, and, and I've never seen this, this scripture verse, but um, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20. Go ahead and turn there. I had never seen this before of, you know, we get so focused sometimes on, okay, what is the World Economic Forum doing and what is happening in Europe? And all the, listen, all of that stuff is important. I, I, you, you know that. I teach that. I teach these things. I have a whole class about understanding the end times. So understanding how these things are going to unfold are, are very important. But most important to God is not what is happening in the world and the evil rising up in the world. It is, the, it is what is happening in the church. Is the church becoming brighter and brighter? Is the church learning to live by the presence of God? So notice, notice what uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20 says. It says, when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah, why was God being patient? During the construction of the ark. God's delay is not because he's delaying justice. God's judgment is coming upon this world. It's called the day of the Lord. It is coming down. Upon this world, it's called the day of destruction when the Lord destroys the wicked and the evil and the unrighteous and the lawless. It's a, it's a terrifying thing. But, but what God is delaying for is that his people would build their ark. So are you building your ark? 
Are you building your ark for what has never happened? See, Noah built his ark for what had never, ever happened in the world. It had never rained, ever. He looked so foolish to the people around him. But Noah, whose name means rest, was a man who walked with God. And Noah is a prototype, a prophetic picture of the kind of people God is looking for at the end of the age, a people who enter into God's rest. Strive to enter into God's rest. Strive, that's what Hebrews talks about. Strive, make pains to enter into God's rest. What does that mean? To live by his life. So while, all the, while God is withholding the day of the Lord, he's waiting patiently for his people to build their own ark. God is not waiting for a date. He's waiting for a marriage. A marriage to his bride of those who've made themselves ready, who've learned how to live by his indwelling life. That's what, that's what this whole entire class is about, is how do you do it? How do you do it? How do you live by his life? We're, you know, I was saying, um, I've been saying recently that right now we're living in this time when there's this lull between birth pains. We've kind of gotten over COVID and, you know, who knows what's the next thing that's going to hit. We're kind of in that lull right now. But I believe God is, is, is shouting to his people, don't waste this time that you have that's precious Learn how to live by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. And so we've been focused, um, starting with the last session, we've been focused on the treasure in you. There is a treasure inside of you. Paul said there is a treasure inside of you. You know, so often we look at, okay, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? I'm this, I'm of the flesh, I'm lawless, I'm rebellious, I'm, I'm hopeless, I'm condemned. All these things we focus on. What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? And you're like, well, you helped that, Brian, because some of the message you preach. And, so, you know, there, there is a need to preach on the things that we need to correct. I'm not denying that. But so often, if we want to make progress, what helps us more than anything else is finding out what's right with you because Christ is in you. That's powerful. See, when you focus on what's wrong with you, it'll paralyze you. When you focus on what's right with you, it'll propel you. It'll move you forward. It'll get, a, get you out of the rut. So often we're just focused on my flesh and I'm just so wicked and my soul is out of control and I, I'm just this terrible person, hopeless hypocrite. And the Lord's like, no, you're not. Christ is inside of you. Christ is in you. And we looked at last Sunday that cr because Christ is in you, you have glory in you. You have rivers of living water in you. You have the holy of holies inside of you. You can go and you can meet with God anytime in any place because Christ is inside of you. You don't have to go here, there, and everywhere to try to find God. He's here. Again, that doesn't mean you miss church. Some people take that the wrong way. It's, uh, I'm almost preaching myself to like, oh, that means I'll skip church. And that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is you don't have to go first here, there, and everywhere to find God. He's right here inside of you. So that's the glory that's in you because Christ is in you. Now, this session we're going to talk about the guidance that's in you because Christ is in you. And we're going to look at the helper, the anointing, the truth, and the fact that God, that God connects you to the infinite mind of, or the spirit connects you to the mind of Christ. As I was writing this, my, this chapter in the book, Indwelling Life, it reminded me of a, a time in 2017 when Dad and I, we were going to Africa. Um, it was before COVID hit. And, you know, we were, if, if you've been on these mission trips, you realize, like, you, you love, I just, we love Africa. And we love the people in Africa. And we love especially our life school leaders in Africa. But a lot of times before you go, it's, there's a lot of pressure and a lot of stress, and a lot of anxiety. You realize, okay, I'm about to go about three weeks with hardly any good sleep. I'm about to be poured out like a drink offering. And you, you start feeling this like, you know, this, this pressure, this anxiety, this warfare around that. And so dad and I were, we were waiting in line to go through security and we're, we both were feeling some of this. 
And we were talking to this retired couple, and, you know, we were just talking, and we're like, hey, where are you guys going? And, they're, you know, they said, oh, we're going on a Viking river cruise to Europe. <laughs> like, where are you guys going? We're like, yeah, we're going on a mission trip, you know. And so we, you know, I remember when we got back through customs, we got back to wait on our plane. All we were talking about back in the back, back you know, waiting for our plane to come is like, man, Viking river cruise, that sounds awesome. <laughs> You know, like, we're like, think about the incredible food and the beautiful scenery. I mean, that, that's what we were thinking. Think about the incredible food and the scenery. And, man, we could go all these places. Like, I want to go on a Viking River cruise. I mean, I literally, we've had this conversation. I mean, I felt like we kept talking about that, it seemed like, for a while. And uh, anyway, anyway, we get back from our trip. And I, I think the Lord heard our conversation because... <laughs> About fast forward about six months, and uh, some dear friends of ours, Kai and Krista Mees, uh, you guys have met them, they've been here before, they invited us to come speak at their Bible college. It was the first time we'd ever been to, uh, to Germany, and they invited us to speak you know, to, their, to, their, to their school uh, two weekends. And so, but in between, we were, we, 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 where they're located is about an hour from Strasbourg, France, an hour from Switzerland. We got to go all through Germany. And, I mean, it was like God gave us a Viking River cruise that was, like, hand-picked, and it was, like, far better, and you had to har hardly pay any money. And it was, like, beautiful. God heard us, you know. God gave us our own personal guide that knew where to take us, where to get great coffee, you know. And every, it almost it was like everywhere we went, we went to this. I remember we were at this one church riddled with bullet holes separating France from Germany on the Rhine River, and we look down, and there's a Viking River cruise ship on that Rhine River. And we're like, <laughs> okay, God's given us our own Viking River cruise. We were in Strasbourg, and we were eating lunch, and there was this Viking River cruise tour going through Strasbourg. And we were all just laughing about this, going, okay, God's got a funny sense of humor. But we had, God provided us with the most incredible guides to take us that was far better than anything we could have done. But it made me think, okay, God has given you, through the indwelling Holy Spirit, a guide that is far superior than any human guide. He's called the helper. He's called the parakletos. In fact, if you turn to uh, John, go ahead and turn to John chapter 14. In John chapter 14, the Lord's talking about the helper who he's going to send. The helper who the Lord is going to send. He's called the helper. If the Lord is called the helper, if the Holy Spirit is called the helper, this might not be rocket science to you. What does that mean? It means he's going to help you. <laughs> there you go. We can end church right now. Why do we try so hard to fix and do and figure everything out when we have the helper inside of us, the parakletos? Four times in, in John 14 through John 16, the Holy Spirit is called the helper, the parakletos. It means, in a general sense, this word means one who's called alongside to help. The helper is in you. Do you need help? I know you do. I can look at you. You need help. I need help. <laughs> I definitely need help. Anna's looking at me going, yeah, you need help. I need help, but you need help too. We all need help. Well, the good news is we have the helper inside of us. He's the helper. He wants to help you. See, what are you going through? What trial are you going through? What crisis are you going through? What, where do you need a breakthrough? Is it in the area of finances? Is it in the area of relationships? Is it in work? Is it in your family? Is it in ministry? What is it that, where is it that you need help? The helper is there inside of you who wants to guide you. See, let's look at John 14, 16. We're going to look at this. And the Lord says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. Just like Jesus was a helper, the indwelling spirit is a helper, is your helper. John 14, 26, but the helper, the parakletos, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. Look at that. That's awesome. Do you need to be taught about anything? It can be related to the things of God. It can be related to secular things. 
The Holy Spirit will teach you how to do everything. He will teach you how to do a home improvement project. Now, he has a real difficult time with me, okay? I'm one of those, I need an idiot's guide to home improvement projects. He really struggles teaching me with that. But he will teach you anything. The helper will teach you anything, secular or sacred. He'll teach you about scripture. He'll teach you about computers. He'll teach you how to do certain things, how to use your iPhone. Larry, you might need to ask the helper how to receive some text messages. So, seriously, yeah, you might want to ask the helper how to do that. <laughs> He's the helper. He will teach you about everything. I'm setting myself up here. And he will bring to your remembrance all that Jesus said to you. Everything Jesus said in his word, the Holy Spirit, the helper will help you remember that. I feel like I need that, that help as I'm getting older and older and older to remember. I'm like forgetting things so much now. Like, help me, Lord, to remember things. In John 15, 26, when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the spirit of truth. We're going to talk about the spirit of truth in a minute, but he proceeds from the Father. The helper testifies of Jesus Christ. The helper glorifies Jesus Christ. The helper wants to glorify Jesus in your life. And then John 16, 7, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. It is better for us because of the helper it is better for us to have the helper in us than to have walked with Jesus for three and a half years like the disciples. That is, that's crazy. That's what Jesus said. The helper inside of you. Okay, so where is it right now that you need help? Is it in your finances? Is it in a, is it in a relationship? Is it in your work? Is it trying to figure out what to do? What's your next step? Where is it that you need help? Because I want to encourage you, go to him inside of you and ask for help. We had something happen to us on Friday. It was a, it was a, a, tri, a bit of a trial on Friday related to finances. I won't go into all the details, but it was, a, it was a trial. It was a test for us. And it was one of those things that really, you know, jolts you, gets your attention or whatever. And... Uh, Anyway, so Angie, she sent me a text, and she sent a picture of my book, page 75, because I've had this sense when I was writing this. I'm going to pull out the old trusted reading glasses here. Um, I had a sense. How's that look, huh? Uh, it looks pretty, how do you, does this look okay? Uh, but <laughs> the old reading glasses, all right. So I had the sense when I was writing in Dwelling Life that when I was writing this particular uh, chapter, especially about the helper, I had this sense, okay, I'm prophesying over someone. I'm prophesying over people who are going to read it. I, I just had this sense that, I haven't mastered the flip down like dad does, but I had this sense that, okay, I, I, you know, if you've ever done that before, you just have this sense, okay, the Holy Spirit is coming upon this writing and I'm prophesying to someone who's going to read it. I didn't know I was going to be prophesying over myself. <laughs> That's the way the Lord works. But I believe it's not just for me. I believe it's for you. I believe it's a prophetic word for you. If you're going through a trial, if you're going through a crisis, uh, financial, personal, whatever, I believe, this is a, I believe this is a word of the Lord to you, okay? So receive this as a word of the Lord to you. Page 75, the indwelling spirit is the helper of the parakletos who has been called to your side. He is fully capable of assisting you. Listen, he is fully capable of assisting you in whatever area you need help. Okay, get that, get that confidence into your spirit. The, whatever, it can be anything. The Holy Spirit is fully capable of helping you in whatever area you need help. Be confident in the Holy Spirit. Be confident he's really good at his job. He will help you in whatever area you're going through. 
whether in a business decision, a personal crisis, a family issue, or a ministry situation, the indwelling spirit is your guide so you don't have to wonder what to do or wander without direction. See, you might lack understanding of a biblical truth or not know how to do, uh, how to write or teach effectively. The Holy Spirit, the indwelling spirit, he has all the answers you need and he's more than willing to assist you when you ask him for help. He is your helper. He's inside of you. He will help you in anything. If you're in school, kids, if you're in school, the helper will help you do awesome in school. If you don't like to read, the helper will help you read. If you don't like math, the helper will help you in math. Whatever it is, if you will just say, Holy Spirit, please help me, the helper will help you. He will give you answers. He will give you breakthrough. He will give you strategies. He will give you creative ideas. He will show you what to do, where to go, who to ask, what to look for. See, you, you can be confident. I just want to say you can be confident. He's got the answer is inside of you because the answer is inside of you. Christ. See, the indwelling spirit is your greatest supporter. He helps you bear the weight of every responsibility and keeps you from being overwhelmed. The indwelling spirit keeps you from being overwhelmed. Those burdens you're trying to carry yourself, you don't have to carry those yourself. The helper inside of you will carry it with you and carry it for you. The helper strengthens you so you do not fall, sink, slip, or shudder when you face trials. The indwelling spirit is more than ready to come to your aid. He is just waiting for you to humble yourself and ask him for help. As your helper, the Holy Spirit is your greatest encourager and is devoted to making you an overcomer and a champion. See, when you don't have the answer, the helper inside of you says, this is the way, walk in it. When stress and anxiety are overwhelming you because you're going through something, the helper says, I will show you what to do. I will guide you so you don't have to go and wander around wondering what to do. The helper inside of you will help you in any area, whether it's family, business, school, relationships, finances, health, whatever it is. The, you can trust the helper more than you can trust a doctor. I, that does not mean you don't, that doesn't mean, what I mean by that is, is you can trust the helper to give you the answer you're facing in health issues and to lead you even more than a doctor would lead you. And I don't mean that you don't go to doctors and I don't mean you don't use what they recommend, but we really should be relying on the Holy Spirit to help us in every area, finances, medical, health related, Again, this is, not one of the, this is not the crazy stuff where you don't, no, don't go to doctors, just trust the healer. You do both, but first go to, the, go to him, the helper, the healer inside of you. If you're in a financial crisis, if you're in a financial trial, the Holy Spirit will give you uncommon wisdom to know what to do. You don't have to look up to heaven and beg God to show you. You turn inward to the helper who's in you and let him show you and reveal. The Holy Spirit wants to help you. He wants to be your guide. He wants to show you this is the way. Walk in it. See, even if I rely on this in work all the time. All the time I get into work. I'm on my software development. I'll get into this situation like, how do you do this? Lord, show me. Holy Spirit, show me. And I'll, I mean, I'm not going to say 
every, almost immediately, it's every, almost immediately every time, sometimes it's banging your head for a while, but eventually, sometimes quick, sometimes it takes some time, eventually you get the answer and you get the solution. The Holy Spirit inside of you is that answer and that solution you're looking for. Trust him. Trust him. See, the, the reason the, the Lord had, you know, in our own, our own personal situation, we go through, we get hit with something. Angie happens to read this, this, this page on that very day when it gets hit. The Lord is saying, trust me. Trust me. The helper inside of you, trust me. Be confident. Be confident that God, that Christ in you is going to show you what to do. He is going to give you the wisdom you need, the knowledge you need, the breakthrough you need, the answer you need, the wisdom you need. He's going to give it to you. He is. You can be absolutely 100% confident without fear, doubt, or worry. He's the helper, and he wants to help you. See, he's the guide that wants to help you. Not only is he the helper, he's the anointing. See, in the Old Testament, the, only the prophets, the priests, and the kings were anointed by God for special use. But in the New Testament, every single believer has the anointing in them. John said, but as for you, the anointing abides in you. See, it's not just the prophet, the priest, and the king that's anointed. You are anointed. It's not just the apostle, the evangelist, the prophet, the pastor, the teacher that's anointed. You are anointed because the anointing dwells in you. See, we get this term anointing from the Old Testament, which meant to take the oil and smear it upon something to set it apart for God's special use. But God has taken his spirit and smeared it upon your, your human spirit to set you apart for his, his use and his purposes. You are anointed. You are anointed. See, Jesus is called the anointed one. Jesus is the anointed one. Jesus Christ. Some of this, this may be revelation to you, but Jesus' last name is not Christ. That might be, a new, that might be revelation to you. <laughs> it's okay. It's, I've done dumb things as well. So, but his last name is not Christ. He was not born to Mary and Joseph Christ. <laughs> Some of you are like, wow, the light's really going on today, bringing the revelation. Christ means anointed. Jesus is the anointed one. He's the anointed one. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good news and to set liberty, set captives free and to proclaim, proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Jesus Christ is the anointed one. And you know what? Jesus, the, the spirit of Christ is in you, making you his anointed one. The, the anointing of the Spirit of God has been rubbed upon and smeared upon your human spirit. Your spirit is anointed. So whatever God has called you to do, whether it's be a minister, pray, preach, prophesy, missions, write, sing, whether it's in business, whether it's run for political office, man, we could really use some anointed people in that, couldn't we? I mean... We really need, I mean, we're a mess, but, you know, I won't go there. But whatever God has called you to do, the anointing is in you to empower you to do what God's called you to do. You have that empowering presence in you. If, you, if God's called you to work in computers, the anointing is on you to do computers. If the Lord has called you to be a manager or a finances or a teacher, the Lord has anointed you to do that. The Lord has called you to preach or to write. The Lord has anointed you to do that because the anointing is inside of you. 
Let's look at John, let's look at 1 John 2:27. John's writing and he says, But as for you, the anointing which you receive from him abides in you. And you have no need for anyone to teach you. How incredible is that? That doesn't mean you don't need teachers. That doesn't mean you don't, you know, like, oh, I'm not going to come to church anymore. I don't need you, Brian, to teach me. Or you. God's given teachers and leaders to teach. He's not hasn't going to reveal everything to you. The point is that you don't have to go first searching YouTube for every answer. You can go to the Lord inside of you and ask him to teach you. How do you live by his life? Ask the anointing to teach you all things. So you don't have a need for anyone to teach you, but as his anointing teaches you about all things, and I love that about the Lord. It's not just the things of the scriptures that he teaches you. Yes, he'll explain the scriptures to you. Yes, he'll show you what this passage means. Yes, he'll unpack to you, this is what Paul meant, or this is what John meant, or this is what Moses meant, or whatever. He will, he will definitely teach you and reveal to you those things, but the Lord will teach you how to do other things. Work on computers, play the drums, do home improvement projects. Again, he has a hard time with me in that area, but sing or whatever. The Lord will anoint you and teach you about how to do all of those things. If you're struggling in school, the anointing is in you for him to teach you about how to do that. It, I mean, that's incredible. We have the, I just want to build your confidence up that you have the anointing in you so you can learn from him. Just ask him, ask him to teach you. It's true and it's not a lie. And just as it has taught you, you abide in him. So you have the anointing. Not only do you have the helper, the parakletos in you, you have the anointing. Your spirit has been rubbed with the anointing oil of the Holy Spirit, empowering you to do whatever God has called you to do. The third thing that, that relates to guidance in you is that God has given you the spirit of truth. The Lord has given you the spirit of truth. You see, we live in a day and age when deception is on the increase, wouldn't you say? Daniel 8.12 says that truth has been flung to the ground. I mean, if you try to just follow social media or the media or whatever, you're going to either be led into the narrative pushed by the elites or, or if you get into social media, you'll be led astray by conspiracy theories and I mean, it's just, it's just so hard. Okay, what really is true? And it leads some people to be like afraid of being deceived and afraid of lies. But I want to tell you, if the spirit of truth is in you, you don't have to be afraid of lies or deception. See, when the disciples said, okay, Lord, tell us, what is a sign of your coming and of the end of the age? The Lord said, the first thing the Lord said, this is, this is really remarkable. Matthew 24, the first thing, you would think, okay, the Lord would say earthquakes, famines, the Antichrist, harlot Babylon, economic shaking, all this stuff. But the first thing Jesus said, see to it that you are not deceived. That's the first thing he said. Deception, if we don't love the truth, this is scary. If we don't Love the truth. God himself will send upon us a spirit of delusion so we will believe what is false. You want to know what's going on in the insanity of this world. As you look at what's happening, you're like, huh, what? That's insane what we're doing right now. And even all this happened. All, and I, I'm not even going to go to all the details, but the LGBTQ, transgender stuff, all that's happening where men become, boys become girls, girls become boys, all that stuff. You're sitting there going, this is insane. This is crazy. People are, you're actually believing this? It's delusion. I would say the reason for it we don't love the truth. We're open and prone to deception 
when we don't love the truth. But here's the really good news. The spirit of truth is in you. And if you rely upon him, he will lead you into the truth. So you don't have to go along with the propaganda and the narrative being spewed out. You can see right through it. The Holy Spirit can give you discernment to know that's not the truth. Or even the extreme conspiracy theories, that's not true. You're true. And you will lead me into the truth. Man, we need this today, don't we? You don't have to be afraid of lies and you don't have to be afraid of deception. You can be confident that if you will learn to lean upon the Spirit of God because the spiritual man discerns all things. If you're leaning upon the Spirit of Jesus Christ, you will be able to discern everything accurately and not be misled by propaganda or conspiracy theories. You will be able to be, know the exact truth of what's going on because the spirit of truth abides in you and he will lead you into all the truth. Be confident. Be confident not only that God will guide, be confident that the spirit will not only guide you, be confident that the spirit will not only anoint you, be confident that the spirit will lead you into all of the truth. That is really good news. Because we are living in that, this day and age where you're just like, you know, especially when COVID hit 2020 for about two years, you're just like, what is even the truth? What is even, what's, what's even the truth about what's happening? The spirit of truth. Now, I, I just say this because we've kind of gotten through that lull of 2020 through 2022 of all that happened with COVID, there's coming, that was just a dress rehearsal, by the way, for what's coming. And so I would recommend that you look back and say, okay, over that period, what did I learn from that? Lord, where was I deceived? Where was I misled? Because Lord, something greater is coming that's going to deceive the entire world. Well, I don't, want to be I don't want to be deceived by that. I don't want to be misled by that. I don't want to be swept into strong delusion and fall into the apostasy that's coming because there is coming an apostasy. We're already seeing a, a many, many people so-called deconstruct their faith in the Western world. It's basically this fancy word that the Bible uses for apostasy. We're living in that day and age when, when we need to know the truth. We've got to have the truth, the truth of God's word, but also the truth of the spirit of God to give you that little, that little nudge, that little uh, impulse, that conviction to say, that's not true. You know what I'm talking about? When you sense that, okay, what he's saying is not true. What she's saying is not true. That's propaganda. We've got, to, we've got to break through the propaganda. We live in a, I believe even if you look at uh, Revelation chapter 18, it says, talking about the harlot Babylon, all the nations were deceived by her witchcraft. It doesn't mean she's like sitting there like making, you know, with a, a black kettle making potions and curses. I, I believe it's, a lot of it has to do with propaganda. The nations are going, the nations have been deceived, are being deceived by propaganda. And it's going to get way worse. And that's not meant to discourage you. That's meant to say, you have the one inside of you that can cut right through propaganda and lies. Even when the whole world's moving in that direction, you can look at it because the spirit of truth is in you. You can say, that is nothing but propaganda. Nothing but lies. Don't go for it. And be a voice that tells others that is not true. The spirit of truth is inside of you. Let's look at John 16, verse 13. When he, the spirit of truth, comes, this is beautiful, he will guide you 
into all the truth. If you rely upon the Spirit, you can be confident in His work. He will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on His own initiative, but whatever He hears, He will speak. It's beautiful. The Lord's telling us the Spirit of truth is going to speak to you. He will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take a mind and disclose it to you. The Holy Spirit inside of you will transfer to your spirit the very thoughts of God so that your spirit will know intuitively the thoughts of God in an instant. You can be confident that God will lead you into all the truth. The spirit, of the, tr the spirit of truth will lead you into all the truth. And he will uh, reveal the future. He will glorify Jesus Christ. The next one. Not only do we have the helper, not only do we have the anointing, not only do we have the spirit of truth, this next one is almost like, is this really true? We have access to the mind, the infinite mind of Jesus Christ. The one who's never, ever, ever been taught anything. You have direct access to his mind. That is pretty remarkable. Let's look at what Paul said, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. First Corinthians chapter two, verse 16. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. What that means, if you read the entire chapter, what that basically means is this. You have the indwelling Holy Spirit. The indwelling Holy Spirit is one spirit with your spirit. The indwelling Holy Spirit has been grafted and joined to your spirit. Your spirit and the Holy Spirit are now one. And just as your human spirit knows intuitively your own thoughts, when you think them, your spirit knows them. In the very same way, because of that spirit-to-spirit -spirit union with the Holy Spirit, when God reveals his thoughts, your spirit can know that intuitively without, apart from conscious reasoning. You can just know immediately, oh, I, you just know something. You just know these thoughts that are transferred from the Lord directly to your spirit. You have this divine knowing. You have access to the mind of Christ. The mind that has never been taught anything. The mind that if you were to gather the smartest men throughout history and combine them all into one room and, and try to say, okay, let's tell God something he doesn't know, not one of them could come up with anything. He's never learned anything. And your spirit-to-spirit -spirit connection with him gives you access to know thoughts of the divine. That is incredible. It can apply to the word of God. It can apply to what's going on in the world. That spirit to spirit thought transference. Where just like you know what's going on in your inward man, you can know what's going on in the Godhead. In the deep things of God. If, if we just learn to do that, if we learn to connect in to that mind of Christ, he will give you the answers and the revelation you're searching for. Now, when Paul quoted, if you notice that I'm, I'm reading out of the New American Standard, but when Paul quoted in, in the translation of this, 
is actually in small caps. That doesn't mean like it does mean today when text messages that someone's shouting at you. Like Paul's not shouting at the top of his voice. What it means is he's quoting from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 13. I want, to, I want to turn there, just turn to Isaiah 40, verse 13. I'm going to read it just from my notes here. Paul's quoting this, and if you've never read Isaiah 40, especially verse 13, Paul wants to bring us up to the transcendence of God to show us that we have access to that which is truly transcendent that which is infinite, that which cannot be articulated and explained, your spirit has access to his mind. So Paul is, or Isaiah is prophesying and said, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? He's talking about 352 million trillion gallons of water in this earth that God measures in the hollow of his hand. Who has marked off the heavens by the span of the hand? 93 billion light years is the size of the universe. And God just says this, and he measures it. That's the mind you have access to. Who's weighed the mountains in a balance and the hills in a pair of scales? Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or has his counselor has informed him? No one has ever taught God anything. With whom did he consult? God's never hired consultants. With whom did God seek counsel? Who gave the Lord understanding? The answer, no one. Who taught him in the path of justice and taught him in knowledge and informed him of the way of understanding. The nations are like a drop in the bucket and are regarded as a speck of dust on the scales. You have access to that mind, to know thoughts of the divine at any moment, at any time. That is what we've been called to. You have the mind of Christ. I have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. To know thoughts of the divine so that when you are needing a breakthrough, you're needing a solution, you're needing wisdom, you're needing answers, you're needing to know what do I do in this situation, you have the mind of Christ. You just need to learn how to cultivate that. You need to learn how to access that. See, the answer you're crying out for is already in you. The wisdom you're searching for is already in you. The knowledge you're looking for is in you. The counsel you need to make wise decisions is in you. You have the mind of Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean you can't look on the internet. That doesn't mean you can't look in books. That doesn't mean you can't ask friends or can't ask counselors or consultants or any of that. What it does mean, though, is we should not ask those people or those sources first. We should say, Lord, direct me. And the Lord might lead you to search for something on Google, or he might lead you to watch a video, or he might lead you to talk to somebody. But the point is, is go to God first for the answer. And let him lead you and let he, him direct you. Wait on the Lord for him to give you his thoughts and his mind. Don't go by your own human reasoning. You're limiting yourself if you live by your reasoning. When you can have the infinite mind of Jesus Christ, whose thoughts are not your thoughts and whose ways are not your ways. So in closing, and I do mean this is closing, so this is not a preacher closing, this is actually the closing. In closing, I want you to be confident. Confident that the indwelling spirit is your helper. I want you to be confident that you are anointed. I want you to be confident 
that the spirit of truth is inside of you. And I want you to be confident. You have access to the mind of Jesus Christ to know thoughts of the divine. Let your doubt and your unbelief be replaced with confidence. Bold confidence. Bold confidence that is not moved by fear, anxiety, or worry when things hit you. Confidence that God will give you everything you need to overcome in your situation. Amen. Lord, we just thank you that you are for us and not against us. Lord, we thank you, God, that your spirit, thank you for giving us your spirit. Lord, we are not of the old creation. We are not like the world. We have God inside of us. We have the spirit of God inside of us. And I pray, Lord, today that you would give people confidence. Lord, where there is feelings of of unbelief, feelings of cynicism, feelings of doubt, feelings of unbelief, and even a feeling of almost losing faith. Lord, that you might replace that with confidence, Lord. Lord, you might replace that with confidence, we ask, and that we would have a faith that does not move, that we are not moved by, or we are not moved by this or that, Lord, an unmoving faith. We're unmoved by trials and tribulations because we are confident in the one who dwells inside of us. I pray that you would release that confidence and courage in us. Lord, that we can trust you as the parakletos, the helper, to give us the answers and the solutions we need, we pray. And Lord, we ask you for that in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.